let me give you just a little bit of framework for what we're doing here. Uh, we've decided this year, because Christmas falls on a Sunday, uh, to do uh, four different sermons. And so we're basically talking about the Christmas story uh, from four different perspectives, and kind of jumping in on a first century onlooker and kind of trying to wrap our mind around how they would have viewed Christmas. Uh, and of course, uh, some of you have decided you want to do the full four-message marathon. And so, Helen, there you are. I see you. Uh, <laughs> stay in that seat every service, then I'll know you're there, okay? All right, and we can love to see you back tomorrow morning if you want to hear some more. Uh, we already had one message earlier today at 3 o'clock, and that was looking at Christmas through the eyes, as best we can, of Caesar Augustus, the emperor. Uh, now this hour, we're going to go ahead and make a, a little bit of a shift here to the next few verses in our, in our chapter uh, and talk about Christmas through the eyes of what we're calling the misfits. Uh, although I, I don't want to give it away, I don't want to ruin the story, but they're not as misfitty as you may think. All right? Uh, this is the vantage point, of course, of the poor shepherds. Uh, who has a nativity scene at home? Show of hands. Most everybody. Okay, I'll guarantee, I call them the gunny sack guys. These are the guys who, in all the plays, and Charlie Brown, and when you go to a nativity scene, they always make you wear the sackcloth that's really itchy to kind of showcase their poverty. And the fact of the matter is, is this is the group that would have been kind of the, the, the lower class back in the first century. Uh, in Israel, nobody really wanted to be a at the end of the day, a shepherd, they didn't have trade schools and pension plans and labor unions. And if you walked into town, you weren't allowed to vote. You weren't allowed to take part of the court system. And you people would have looked down their nose at you. So some of that is true. Uh, and the way that we view shepherds, some of that is true. Uh, but you're going to see a little bit of a shift here this evening. And my prayer is you'll have a different view of the shepherds from this point forward. So if you have your Bible, open it with me to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, and let's go ahead and begin reading back in verse 1, just to get our feet under us and make sure that we understand the story. And big point number one is just we're going to call it the misfits, the misfits. We'll go through the misfit, the message, uh, and of course the meaning of that message. In Luke chapter 2, verse 1, go ahead and read with me. Luke tells us that in the days, in those days, a decree had went out from Caesar Augustus. That a census was to be taken of all the inhabited earth. And this was the first census taken while a man named Quirinius was governor of Syria. We talked about this first hour, uh, and we won't go back into it, but basically you've got upwards of 50 million people that are moving their way around the empire. And it's clearly an act of God that Mary and Joseph arrive in the right city at the right time, carrying the right Savior if you want to hear that, go back and listen online. Verse 4, Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. It's way funner to say it that way. In fact, say it with me. It's not Bethlehem. That's so English. It's Bethlehem. You got to get it coming out your throat. Some of you have been sick. You're going to enjoy this. Ready? Here we go. On three, you've been doing a lot of this practice. Ready? One, two, three. Hey, they got it. I don't know about you guys. Luke, come on, man. <laughs> Bet lachem, right? You got that? Okay, keep reading. Okay, verse 5. In order to register with Mary, who was engaged to him and was with child, uh, and then while there, interesting, you got the entire narrative of Luke and what we call the Christmas story, and it's all boiled down to basically a verse and a half. The days were completed for her to give birth. She gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger. That's it, the Christmas story. That's all you get from a human perspective. And then here we go, verse 8. In the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by what? We all know the song, okay? So a lot has been made, like I said, about the shepherds and their role uh, and how they kind of stood at the, the bottom rung of the social ladder, lumped in with the tax collectors, um, and even the Mishnah, the historic early, the early Jewish histories say that fact. I'll, I'll read it to you here real quick. You know, in quote, shepherds were never to be rescued from a pit. Uh, here's another one. Rabbi Jeremiah wrote, quote, "'Tis forbidden to buy milk from a shepherd as it is likely stolen,' end quote. 
So that's the way that they were viewed by the time you get to the first century. Not always in biblical history. You go back to Isaac and Jacob and the patriarchs, and of course for a while um, they did very well. But here's the element that I want you to rectify in your mind. There's an historical key. There's an historical key that's often missed about the shepherds, the gunny sack guys, okay? And here's what it is. These could not have been, they could not have been random shepherds. Because we know that they're in the fields of Bethlehem, very new, near to Jerusalem, around the time of the Passover in the winter. And we also know from the early histories of the Jewish people that that was the only way that would have been possible to have sheep near Jerusalem is if they were meant to be the special sacrificial sheep watched over by the priest or shepherds employed by them in order to be sacrificed at Passover. Other than that, there would be no shepherds and no sheep anywhere around Jerusalem in the environs of Jerusalem. In fact, let me just read for you real quick what the Mishnah says on that. Quote, it's forbidden to keep flocks in Israel except in the wilderness. And the only flocks otherwise kept would be those for the temple services. End quote. We even know there was a tower called the Migdal Eder. And what it was was called the Tower of the Flock, where there off, I think it was the western side of Jerusalem, you would have a, a watchtower where the priest could send someone up in order to watch over the, the hundreds or the tens of thousands of sheep that were about to be used for the Passover, okay? So I don't want to ruin your image of the poor shepherds. I, I don't want to ruin your nativity scene. You don't got to go home and rip their little gunny sacks off them. I'm not saying you need to do that. They probably weren't wealthy people, okay? But what I do want you to understand here, friends, is that there's something much deeper going on, okay? The message that the angels are about to give, it's not about helping a group of poor people. It's not about the poor, impo impoverished shepherds and some kind of social gospel, what you have here are the angels coming to a group of men who were watching over the sacrificial lambs, and guess what? They're going to be the first ones to receive the message of the sacrificial lamb. You see? There's a lot bigger thing going on in the narrative. So now with that in the back of your mind, I want you to see the backdrop with which now Luke makes his switch as he begins driving us towards the climax of this pericope. All right, verse 9. Here we go from the misfits to the message in verse 9. Here it is and an angel of the Lord. Just one at first, just one, have that in your mind, just one. Suddenly, you can already feel the, the power of the moment, suddenly stood before them. I mean, you can almost picture the way this is, right? They're out there, you've got the Migdal Adir, you, you, they're, they're looking down at the field, some of them are out there, they've got a group of Passover lambs that are all gonna be killed here in a couple of weeks, and all of a sudden, there's one angel standing there, suddenly, the, the Greek is actually you know, out of nowhere, and then look what happens next, the glory of the Lord, key word, the doxa, shone around them, and they were terribly, finish it with me, what happened to them? They were frightened, okay? Now, does everyone, everyone study the Shekinah glory of God? I know if you come to this church, you've heard me mention it a few times, the doxa, doxological, the glory of God. So in the Old Testament, y'all will remember there was that pillar cloud that guided the, the Israelites through the desert. There were times where the cloud would come down upon the tabernacle or the Mount of Transfiguration when you got Peter, James, and John, all right? Whenever the glory of God kind of breaks through the veil from heaven to earth, it's always the same response by humans. What is it? They fall on their face. In fact, the word you see a lot in the New Testament is the word comatose. You fall on your face and you, and you lay there, which, side note, by the way, if you're newer to the church, let me just, our church knows this. When you hear these churches and they're saying, oh, the glory cloud's coming in our building, and they're whipping out their cell phones and they're taking pictures of it, listen, that's not the glory of God, okay? All right? That's a sham. That's a farce. If you're part of one of those movements, you need to hear that. In Scripture, when God shows up, people hit their face and they don't move. This is one angel, one angel. And the glory of God through one angel causes this group to fall flat. Verse 10, and the angel said to them, don't be what? <laughs> Why did he say that? Because they're freaking out. He says, get up, dust off, listen, look. I bring you good news of great joy, which shall be for all the people. That means all types of people. I'm bringing you a good message. It's great joy 
for all the types of people, like the Jews and the Gentiles. It's not just going to be for Israel, he says. For today, in the city of David, there has been born for you. Now, you got a pen. I need you to pull it out, okay? If you're using your phone, go to the highlight feature. Actually, take a picture. You know on your iPhone when you can push the two buttons at the same time? Take a picture of this and keep it with you because what you're about to read are the, is the single most important sentence ever given to planet Earth. The single most important sentence ever given. The single most important message ever given to planet Earth is right here. Here we go. Underline it. For today in the city of David, about a mile down the road, there has been born for you. Okay, you ready? Let's read it together. First is what? A what? Savior. Very good. Family room over there? Overflow? If you're in there, I want to hear you come through the wall. Here we go. Ready? For you a Savior who is what? Christ the what? Okay, that right there. He says, I want you to go down to Bethlehem, I want you to walk for a mile, and I want you to look through all the stables, and he's going to actually describe to them that they're going to find this baby wrapped in cloths, because there would be other babies in Bethlehem, the only way they would know it was him was he was in a stable in a feed trough, and he's wearing these little swaddling clothes. And he says, down there in Bethlehem is a deliverer, and this is key, who is the Christ, the Christos, the anointed one, and the Kyrios, the Lord, the supreme authority. That, that right there is the most important message ever given to mankind. In fact, if you have a pen, in the margin of your Bible, just jot down a few notes, okay? Number one, just write down the Savior. Just write down the Savior, right there in the margin next to verse 11, okay? You're, you're not going to hear the word save much anymore. You just won't hear that word. People don't like that word in church. You need to be saved. You got to be saved uh, from your sins. Uh. You don't hear that anymore. Why? Because it's an old, they call it turn or burn term, right? And so nowadays, what do we say? When you go to evangelical churches, what does everyone say? Well, you, 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 uh, you, you have, you're unfulfilled. You've got brokenness. You heard that? You lack purpose, and you, you lack destiny, and, uh, and uh, you've got financial challenges and mental health struggles, and, and you need Jesus to come along, and you need him to plug the holes of your life so that you can just be fulfilled. You're, you're wounded. Anybody heard that? You're wounded, okay? Now, the reason this is so important, the word save means what? There, right now, if one of you fell over in your chair and had a heart attack um, and you're laying there on the ground and you're holding your arm, what are you going to want one of our medics to come do? Come on. Do you want him to make you feel fulfilled? <laughs> Is that the goal? Give me some destiny pills. No, 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 you don't want, what do you want? You want to be, come on, you be saved. Why? Because you're dying. The reason that word is so important is because what? There is a universal problem that mankind has, and it's not brokenness. It's not purposelessness. It's not being unfulfilled. There's a universal problem that mankind has. What's that problem? Come on, Romans 3.23. Finish it with me. You got it? Romans 3.23. For all have sinned. Only some of us? All of us. See, we're, we're not just wounded where we need a little bit of healing. And we're not, we're not just dirty where we need a little scrub off, you know, <laughs> clean off the dirt. We're what? We're dead in our sins. We're dead in our trespasses. We can't get up. It's cold, hard, dead. You're, you're literally laying there in the corner's office, spiritually speaking, and, and they're doing the autopsy, and you and I have no chance. Hence the greatest message in all humanity. The Savior's there. The Savior from sin, which leads you to the next line. Look out of here. You got your pen out? The Savior, the Christos, the anointed one. That's important, too, because what he does there is he goes all the way back to the book of Daniel. 700 years earlier, this prophecy was given. Now, I don't want to bore you all because it's Christmas, you know, but let me just do a little bit of nerdy stuff, okay, real quick. When you get home tonight, Well, it's Christmas Eve. You're not going to do this. Okay, tomorrow. Write down Daniel 9, verse 25. I want you to go online, and I want you to do a study of how specific Daniel's prophecy was, okay? 
because an angel tells him there's going to be a decree. We know that's the decree of Artaxerxes. You can study Nehemiah and you can find it. And get this, he says from the decree of Artaxerxes, there's going to be what he calls 69 weeks and 7 weeks. Those are called heptads, periods of 7 years. That's 483 years until what? This word right here, the anointed one comes, the Messiah comes, okay? And get this, Jesus rides into Jerusalem on 32 AD down to the very month and the very day that Daniel had prophesied some 700 years earlier. Here's what you're seeing here. The angels are grabbing that term that Daniel had used and that all the Jews had been waiting for and saying, down in Bethlehem is not only the Savior, down in Bethlehem is also the anointed one that's been prophesied. Which leads us to word number three. You ready? Look at it. The Savior, who's the Christ, who's the what? who's the Lord. Now, if you look really close, you have a pin. You can circle it. You notice how it's a capital L? You see that? And every time in your Bible that you see Lord connected to Jesus, it's always a capital L, because what that's doing in the Greek is implying divinity the same way in the Old Testament, the Hebrew implied divinity through using the term Yahweh, the tetragrammaton, right? You've heard that before? That's what they're doing. That's what it's doing. That's why basically, that's why also why the foundational confession of the church from the very beginning was Jesus is Lord. So so what the angels are saying here is, you go down to Bethlehem, and I want you to go around the corner, I want you to look for a stable, there's going to be a feed trough, and in the feed trough is the deliverer from your sin, who's also the anointed one, prophesied by Daniel 700 years ago, and is the Lord, that is God in the feed trough. That's God in the feed trough. That right there, friends, tells you why all the ecumenical stuff will never work. Now, I know it's Christmas and I need to be nice. I get that. I'm going to be super gentle. I get that. I promise. But that right there tells you why the ecumenical stuff, listen, if you come here tonight and you believe that all roads lead to heaven, and we're all hearing that now, right? The Mormons and us are kind of the same because we can all watch Chosen. I know you had that debate with your family before you got here. Can we watch it or not, right? Listen, and 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 you heard Catholics and Protestants now coming together. Who heard about, they're actually calling it the the, the new one world religion and the headquarters is in Abu Dhabi. Has anybody heard about that? They got the three basilicas, the mosque, the church, and the synagogue. They're building it there. And that's because the Pope and the Imam got together and said, we're going to do the Abrahamic family religions and we're going to have the fraternal world order on religion, and some of you are like, I thought that was just in the old Left Behind books. It's happening! Add Jehovah Witnesses in. I mean, there's a constant push for us all just to go, well, hey, Jesus is what? A road. He's one of the anointed ones, and he's a Lord, and he's a possible Savior, but I want you to answer with me right now. What did the angels say? Is that a possibility, yes or no? Jesus is what? He's the Savior. He's the Christ. And he's the what? Which is what makes verse 12 so interesting. This will be a sign for you. You'll find a baby wrapped in claws and lying in a manger. I want you to see how astounding all this is, okay? Because this is where Christmas, the Christmas parallel gets really real. Friends, listen closely. The Savior that was born in Bethlehem must be born in you. It's not enough that Christ was born in a stable. What matters is whether or not he's been born in your heart. And listen, if you have a small view of your sin, you're going to have a really small view of the Savior. And what this text does is it opens us up to the reality that there needed to be someone to come who could be born in a a perfect birth and who could live a perfect life and who could die a substitutionary death. And there was no man that ever could do it. You couldn't do it and I couldn't do it. The only possibility was that God had to come and do it. And if I'll simply turn from my sin and from myself and I'll put my faith in this one who came in a manger, guess what? God says, I will be saved. I'll be saved from my sin. I guarantee there's some of you who come in tonight and you think that you're okay with God. 
The reality, friends, is this text tells us that you're in rebellion against God. And the only solution for your sin is the Savior, Christ the Lord, who was born in that stable, in a feed trough. Which leads us to the meaning of the whole thing. You ever wonder why all this happened? Why would you do it this way, God? Why save us? Why do it through Christ? It's right there in verse 13. Look at this. And suddenly, there appeared with the angel, I love this, a multitude. Have you got your pen? Can you underline multitude? And then in the margin, can you just write 10,000 plus? Because Greek numbers only go up to 10,000. So... Can anybody picture 10,000 people? How many would that be? So how much does like Angel Stadium hold for a, car, a harvest event? Maybe 20, 30,000? I want you to picture that many angels suddenly in the sky, and he says a multitude, an army of angels are suddenly there, and they're all praising God. Like the veil between heaven and earth is peeled back and all the angels are dropping their cloaking devices and the sky begins to boom. And what does it boom with? Verse 13, praising God, saying, glory to God in the highest. That right there, friends, that verse right there is the pinnacle of all things. That's the climax, the high point of all creation, the glory of God. That's the highest thing that exists in the universe God being glorified by his creatures. I know some of you are going, no, 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 Tony, it's the salvation part. He saved us. Why did he save you? He saved you to glorify him. And forever, if you're saved, what are you not going to be doing? We're going to be glorifying him. If you could peel back the layers of heaven right now, what would you see? Angels and elders, all creatures of all time, redounding to his praise and glorifying him. That's why he did what he did, to call out a group of people unto his praise and glory forever. And then in verse 14, here's the verse that's always skipped on the Hallmark cards. I guarantee you've never seen the whole verse on a Hallmark card. Here it is. And on earth, peace. Everybody wants peace. Everybody promises peace. All the presidents always say peace, peace on earth. And on earth, peace among men. And that's where the Hallmark cards all stop. Right there. That's the part everyone ignores at Christmas. Who gets the peace of God? Who gets to stop the war with God, not be rebels with God? Who who gets to put the arms down and the guns down? And who gets to be saved and brought into the heavenlies? And the world says everybody. Hallmark says everybody. Peace on earth, goodwill to men. Ellipsis, dot, 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 and then Merry Christmas. But I want you to see what the angels actually said. Look at it there in verse 14. And on earth, read it with me, peace among men with whom he is what? Oh my goodness, whoops. You see what Satan does? See what Satan does? Some of you came in the room and you thought we're all gonna have peace with God, we're all children of God, we're all fine. And what you just learned is no, there's only a certain group that gets peace with God. Saving peace is only for those whom God gives it to. In fact, the Greek there is men of his good pleasure, on whom his favor rests. Okay? Make no mistake. Make no mistake about this. If you don't listen to anything any preacher ever says again, listen to this. You ready? The angels are not standing there praising the shepherds for what they've seen. The angels are not sitting there praising Mary because she birthed a baby. And the angels are not standing there excited that the Magi brought the right right spices to to the manger. Or for those of you that want to argue a year or two later to the house. What are they praising? The awe-inspiring fact that God himself came down and decided to be a baby so that he could save wretches like you and like me. Merry Christmas. All right, insert old illustration here. Ready? Everyone heard the story in World War I about the guys who fight in the trenches? Nod yes. There's never been a Christmas sermon that didn't have this story in it, okay? Some of you don't know this story. You're new to church? Oh, you're going to love this. Okay, true story. Here you have World War I. Everyone's killing each other. It's Christmas Eve, though, and so no one wants to fight. 
dead quiet. You got no man's land in the middle, picture all the barbed wire. And all of a sudden, one of the sides, whether it's the German side or the French side or Bulgarians or whoever it was at the time, you have to do your history, they start singing. I think it was Silent Night. We just sang. And then they started putting up little Christmas trees and suddenly one man stood up and didn't get shot, so he walked out into no man's land in the middle of the night. The other side got up, put his gun down, walked out. They started giving each other haircuts and they're singing songs together, celebrating Christmas. And for one night... In the middle of war, there was peace because of Christmas. Friends, that's why this story right here should humble you because God made peace in war with your soul. And if you believe in him, it's because he decided to take great pleasure on you. And if you believe in him and are saved, it's because he decided to delight in you. It's not because you, you woke up and you said, oh, Jesus, today I, I'm going to follow. This says that he came in and he opened up your eyes. And that's why if you're truly saved, you'll look back on a period in your life and you will know cardinally, truthfully, without a shadow of a doubt, the moment that you went from darkness to light. You'll know when he opened up your eyes and he transformed you. You'll know when he gave you a new heart. And by the way, if you walk in tonight, and you're like, I've never really had that. I've always called myself a Christian. I just verbalized it. I prayed a prayer when I was young. But you're not sure of it. You don't remember the, the drastic shift in your life, the transformation. Friends, that's not him. That's not him. That's not him. When he grabs a soul, he doesn't just knock on the door. He breaks the door down, and he takes it for himself by his good pleasure. Now, question for you, you ready? What do you think happens to a group of people who have just received the greatest news of all time? Do you think they hold on to it? No. Look at verse 15, the model. The misfit, the message, the meaning of the model, verse 15, it came about when the angels had gone from them to heaven, the shepherds began saying to one another, hey, what do you want to do? Well, let's, let's listen. Let's go straight to Bethlehem. Let's see the thing that's happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And then they came in haste. Look at that word. And they found their way to Mary and Joseph. And the baby as he lay in the manger in verse 17. And when they had seen this, they made known the statement which had been told them about the child. What you have right there, friends, is just a picture of what saved people do. First, they seek out Christ. Then they tell everyone about Christ. And don't miss the order there. You hear and you herald. You hear and you herald the truth. There was an old missionary, some of you will know this story for sure, uh, in the Cultural Revolution in the 1960s, uh, and he was um, caring for, he was a doctor caring for some of the, the Chinese who were under the scourge of Mao. And then there was a, a day where a man came in who couldn't see, he was blind. And so the doctor looked at him and he was able to help cure his cataracts so suddenly he could see. So two, two, two weeks go by, <laughs> and all of a sudden, the doctor walks out of his little hut, his village hut, and he looks into the jungle, and out get this come walking 48 guys holding a rope, being led by the doctor, all blind guys, who had just taken them 250 miles over the hills of the Hunan province so that they too could, could see. Once you find the answer, you got to take all your friends and family to see it. So I want to ask you a really honest question tonight. It's actually question 1A and 1B. You ready? Here we go. I want to slide this right over to your 2022 Christmas. And I want you to answer me out loud. And if you don't, I'm going to stare at you until you do. Yeah. Yeah. Has God taken pleasure on you yet and saved your soul? Yes or no? Do you believe in Jesus, the Savior, the Christ, the Lord? Yes or no? Okay, then question number two. Here and then Harold, are you going to do everything in your power to tell your friends and family who are lost the next 24 hours? See, 
This is one time a year where you're going to be sitting next to people on a couch eating really bad fudge. And you're going to wake up tomorrow morning and you're going to be sitting there and they're going to want to talk about football. And they want to talk about, just please promise me, you'll take a moment to say, God came and he saved my soul. And I have to tell you, whether you want it or not, that's between you and him. But I've got to tell you that Jesus, the Christ, the anointed one, he came, he's the Lord, and he's the anointed. And I want you to know what I know. And I want you to have the hope of Christ. Because that's what saved people do. You don't hold on to the truth. You don't hold on to love. You don't hold on to rescue. The shepherds do what people do when they've heard the greatest message of all time. 